So this week, we're going to be talking, like I said before, about revival. We're going to be talking about that revival is six days away. And many people within this church have done a lot of stuff so far leading up to it. But there's a lot of more work to be done. A lot of people from other churches have worked hard to do it. A lot of people have been praying for it. And it's those prayers that have led things to become bigger and bigger and bigger. I know Woody and I, like I said before, we've been praying about it for a couple of years that this is all going to come together. But like I said earlier in the service, today is more about us being revived. Are we in the right heart and in the right spirit to put out a revival? Where is our heart today? Where was it yesterday? Where is it going to be tomorrow? We talked at Sunday school while looking at yourself in the mirror every morning and saying, who do I want to be today? Who do I want to be for Christ today? We can start off our morning with a bad, grumpy attitude like we sometimes do, and it seems like no matter how good your day goes, you still have that grumpy attitude. You can have a perfect day, but when you start it wrong, nothing seems to make you happy. But there's also those days where you wake up with a great attitude, you say, you know, I'm going to stay positive. And no matter what goes wrong throughout the day, you just roll with it. Because we all have things that pop up throughout the day, off and on, that we need to just kind of roll with it because it's not exactly what we like. It's not what's great. But we roll with it because it, it's dependent on our attitude. And that's, that's what I really want to talk about today, along with how we opened it up, is if we fall away, he's there for us. He's always there to back us up. Even if we fall away, he's there. So we're going to start out today in 2 Chronicles. So if you turn to 2 Chronicles, chapter 7 is where we're going to be starting out. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 15. So when we talk about the readiness of our hearts being ready, whether you're here, whether you be watching online, I ask, is your heart ready? Are you ready for a revival? We look at where our country is right now. We look at where the church is right now. Our country, as we see it, no matter which side of the fence you're on, you can agree our country is off the rails. Our leadership is off the rails. Our state is off the rails. We see all the riots happen. Mostly because they think hey, this is fun. Do they truly believe in what they're rioting about? Maybe those who are protesting believe what they're protesting about. But do the rioters want to do that, or is this just something fun? The morality seems to be gone in our country. Where have we always looked for our moral compass? We've looked to the churches. That is where our moral compass comes from. That is how we learn how to live our life. Morality comes from the Bible talk in the churches. Where have our churches been the last few months? Lock the door. When we need it most, the doors are locked. Entire denominations have said, well, lock the doors. Churches that want to reopen can. Some stayed open, some have reopened. And there's a good amount that have reopened, and that's great. But those of us that are open, we need to take a stand. And say, you know what, the, the reality of our country, the reality of our state, is it's off the rails. And the church in general is quiet. Why are we quiet? Why are we not standing up and helping people out? That's where our heart needs to be. Again, we talked at Sunday school about these types of things. So if you didn't come out to Sunday school, I'd like to invite you Next week, we're going to be going a little bit deeper into the discussion we had today. But the spirit of revival, the churches are quiet. They're not going out and really helping and doing. The church is getting quiet. There's not much going on. And that's why I want to start today. And if it doesn't get through your mind today, then tomorrow you wake up and say, okay, it's today but not keep pushing it off. When am I going to make a true commitment to the Lord, a commitment to do what's right, 
today. Today is the day. The old statement of today is the first day of the rest of your life, it's true. Today. Let's not wait any longer. Let's not hold off another month because you know what, well, maybe tomorrow won't come. Whether it be that first commitment or whether it be the recommitment, tomorrow may never come. There is a mass falling away right now. And again, the churches are just not stepping up. People are not worshiping together. The online services are great because it gives something. But like you folks are today, getting in amongst other people. Hebrews 10, 25 says, For sake not the assembling of yourselves together. I think that's pretty cut and dry. There's some people that say, as a person, to forsake not meaning be there. There's some that will say that that also means don't stand in the way of people getting together. Either way you look at those statements, it still is get together. Be together and worship as a group together. And that's what we need to do across the board. So, I was told that last week there was two challenges given out, or three challenges, and they only remember two of them. One of the challenges is just to, remember, to memorize a couple verses. Does anybody have those verses memorized? So you can even tell me, I don't think, what those verses were. Anybody memorize those verses? Lindsay, you were here. Can you memorize those verses? She goes, no. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I said no. <laughs> but that's a thought. It was a challenge given, but did you memorize it? Well, it's these little challenges along the way, but do we do these little challenges? The second challenge that he remembered he gave out was did you invite someone to church every day of the week? That's another thing that we can look at and say, well, where was my heart? Why didn't I invite that person? It's difficult, yes. But after we do it a lot of times, and I thought, oh, well, it's going okay, I did. But it's difficult. But after we start doing it a while, it becomes much less difficult along the way. And we get that kind of a thought of, okay, well, they said no, what about you? Well, you said no, okay, what about you? And you just keep on going. You just keep asking. Because eventually you're going to find somebody that's got interest. And if somebody gives you attitude, to you, next. And we get that attitude going forward on that. And we, again, the falling away, the coming back. And that's what we're going to look here in 2 Chronicles. So if you're with me in 2 Chronicles as we look at this. Again, chapter 17, verses 11 through 15. And I know we've talked about this section in the past, but we're going to do it again. Because it really fits into where we're going with this. Starting with verse 11. Then Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart, and to make the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard thy prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes shall be opened and my ears attend to the prayer that is made in this place. Now this is a promise made to Solomon for the people of Israel. So we got to think, well, why was it written? How was it written? Who was it written to? It was written to the Israelites at the time of the temple dedication given to Solomon. This is a promise for that time. But is that promise still valid today? Absolutely that promise is still valid today. And if we look at this, what we talked about a few minutes ago, the land we're living in right now is greatly off the rails and messed up. We see people talking about, man, we just need to, to pray that the world will come back together. And yeah, that's part of it. But the number one thing it says here, will humble themselves. If the people will humble themselves, 
That's the number one thing. If we as a nation or as we as an area or we as a church, if we humble ourselves, number one, number two, pray about it. Because the prayer helps with being humble. If we humble ourselves, if we go to him in prayer and truly seek his face, seeking his face is also seeking his will. If we humble ourselves, if we pray about it, if we seek his will, he will heal our land. But if we don't, he won't. We need to do these things. I will heal. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. The last thing we've got to do is turn from those wicked ways. Now it's time to look in the mirror. Do any of us have any wicked ways in our hearts? If you say no, you're a liar. We all do. We all have wicked ways in our hearts. Every single one of us. We've got bad desires. We've got bad thoughts. You should have seen what that person did to me yesterday or said to me yesterday. I'm mad about it. Do we need to get mad about it? Or do we need to give it over to God? Do we need to let it affect our life? Or just give it to God and get over it? Does that bad statement said to us, or that bad thing done to us, now have to affect the rest of our day? The rest of our week? How long are we going to let that affect us? Or do we forgive it and turn it over to God? Those are the wicked ways that are in our hearts. Just Keeping that in our heart to be, oh, I didn't like what that was done. I didn't like what happened there. Oh, pray. Seek his face. Turn from our wicked ways. If we do that, it says his eyes are open. His ears are attentive. Or attentive, depending on what version you're reading from. His ears are open, his eyes are open, and he's saying, I'm just waiting, waiting on you. Are you going to do this? Because I'm willing to heal your way. I'm willing to heal you. I'm willing to do this for you. All you got to do is talk to me. All you got to do is ask. But you got to change your ways. Your wicked ways are not going to work. You need to change and to come to me. It's all he's saying here. Simple statement. And he's asking him, just, just do these things. And I will heal your way. Seems awful simple. There's a lot of non-believers. How do those non-believers become believers? It's up to us. How often do we witness to our friends? It's kind of easy, right? How often do we witness to people who don't know? That's nothing right there. We all have people in our lives we don't like. Do we invite them to church? Do we witness to them? Not usually. I really don't want to be sitting next to them in church, right? This is not going to be fun, right? Well, kind of quiet here. You're just over there. You're just over there. You can stay apart. It's okay. But we still invite those people whether we like them or not. We still witness to those people whether we like them or not. That is what we're called to do. We are called to humble ourselves. That humbling attitude of, I don't like them, but I guess I need to invite them. I guess I need to make them part of it, whether I like it or not. Let's jump a little bit farther ahead into Psalm. We turn to Psalm chapter 107. This is more of the answer to that promise. He promised that if we do these things, he will heal the land. But this is some times where it actually happened. We can look at it and say, yeah, he did heal. He did straighten it out for people. So if you're with me in Psalm 107, we're going to be reading the whole bunch here. 1 through what? I think we put down 31, but we're going to go to 32. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them 
out of their distress. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go into a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul, and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God, and contemned with the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and out of the shadow of death, and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools, because of their trans transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distress. He sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare his works with rejoicing, that they go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commanded and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down into the depths. Their soul is melted because of the trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distress. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then they are glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Kind of cause and effect over and over and over in here. Every time they messed up, he saved them. He filled the promise that he gave us back in 2 Chronicles and that he gave to Solomon. He fulfilled these promises through here. We can look at different ones. The first one, he wandered in the wilderness, hungry, thirsty, and homeless. Does that sound an awful like, a lot like the Exodus? They wandered for 40 years. And when God said it was time, he brought them to the desired land. He gave them what they needed. They sat in darkness and in bondage. And then he broke their chains. Look at most of the New Testament. Everybody that really stepped out in faith did some time in jail for it. A difficult life. But they spent some time in jail for it. He saved them from it. They were fools because of their sins. Stressed out. They were near death. He sent out his word and healed them. How was the world around the year zero? A total screwed up mess. They were crying out for something. This one word, the word, is something we see in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. When they had all these problems, when everything was going messed up at that time, what happened? God sent his son, Jesus, because that's all that was going to work at that time. That was all that would be able to straighten it out, is to send his son, Jesus, at that time. They were messed up. I got you. I'm going to send my son, Jesus. They were in storms at sea. He calmed the sea and saved them. 
couple different times, Jesus was with his disciples. One time he walked out on water to them. What's the problem, folks? Peace, be still. He was sleeping in the boat once, big waves around them. Peace, be still. Chill out, people. This is good. Have a little faith. What about Paul and his multiple shipwrecks he was in? What about Jonah being thrown overboard and saved? There's a bunch of them that fall into this one. But the key to each one of them, that you'll see in each one of them, there's one key. He did nothing until they cried out to him. We can do everything within our power to make our situation better. And we've all been in this boat. We've all been, whether it be down in the dumps, just life is not treating us well. I got this. I'm going to fix it. And it gets worse. I got this. I'm going to fix it. And we continue to got this, fix it. Do we ever actually fix it? Not usually. We usually make it worse. And then when we get to the, the bottom of that wave, we cry out, Lord, I got nothing. I got nothing. There's nothing I can do. I need you, Lord. Help. And sometimes that prayer is nothing but help. You got no words. You've got nothing. All you've got is help. Jesus, help. We may not be able to put it in words. But when we cry out to him, we think back to the Exodus. They were slaves. When did he come and fix it? He heard their prayers. He heard them crying out. He's waiting. He's waiting for each and every one of us individually with the problems we all have in our lives to just simply cry out and say, God, I got nothing here. I need your help. He's waiting for each of us, even in our good days. Everything is going great. Lord, you can still make it better. Because I'm still here. You can still make it better, Lord. Cry out to him every day. Lord, I'm in the dumps. Lord, I'm on the mountaintop. Things are great. We can still cry out to him to make it better yet. But there's also another key component to this. The praise. When he does these things for us, and we can see it with the lepers that got healed and only one came back and said thanks. When he does these things, when we pray for help, and we all do, we're all at those points in our lives where it's important to help me with this. I don't care if it's a kid in school that wants help with a test, whether it's an adult that's got an issue with work or with the family or the dang car won't start. We all have these issues and we cry out. How often are we thankful when he does straighten it out? How often do we actually say, Lord, you had me there. You had my back. And sometimes in these situations, we may not see them really well because he gives us a little progression of better. A lot of times it's not bad, boom, good. It's a progression. But we look back and say, wow, was that a yes to my prayer or what? Wow, he really took care of me in that situation. We can look back and see it each of these times. But may not in that time. And when we when we see it, God, thank you. Thankful, thankfulness for what we did. What we how we got through it with him. We need that spirit of thanksgiving. It's different steps of wherever we're at. He can make it better. But when he does, be thankful. We do our praise and prayer time because of verse 13. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. That's verse 13 of chapter 108 in Psalms. I have to tell you where that one was. We go to that. Through God, we shall do valiantly. So we look at this revival coming up. If we do it through us, it's a mess. If we do it through God, valiantly. For 
It is he that shall tread down our enemies. The enemies of the world that come against us, he'll tread them down. We will do valiantly through him. So what do we want? Do we want to be valiant? Do we want to be revived? Or do we want to stay stuck in that same world we've been? We need to ask ourselves that every day. What do we want for today? Do we want to be stuck in that rut? Or do we want to get out of that rut? Do we want to do better because of him? Valiant. Is that what we want? What do we do? We cry out to him. It's a simple thing. We cry out to him. Lord, I need you. Lord, help me. Thank you for what you did. Thank you. Thank you for how you helped me. Thank you. But verse 32, the last verse that we read there, let them exalt him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Put those two together. We will do valiantly if we follow him. If we praise him, that's what he wants. Praise. Praise him for what's going on. Praise him in the assembly of the elders. Exalt him in the congregation of the people. When something good is happening in our life, we're supposed to be a big family here. And if we're a big family here, any of your family at home, something great happens in your life, are you going to tell them? If something great happens within your life here, are we going to tell each other? We should. Everybody should be happy when something good happens in someone else's life. So let's praise him. Let's exalt him for what he has done for us. Because again, he is there all the time just waiting for us to come to him. But we're not going to read it, but I'm just going to allude to it. Think about the prodigal son. The prodigal son who totally messed up his life, said, Dad, I want my part of the inheritance. Basically saying, Dad, you're dead to me. I want my part of the inheritance. I need it now. I'm not going to wait for you to die. I want my money now. Give me what is coming to me. And we're out yeah. Do we ever see that in ourselves with God? Give us what we want right now. And I'm going to take this, and I'm going to squander it. I'm going to waste it. He wasted it through riotous living. Wasted every bit of it. He had nothing. Came to the end of his rope. And what did he do? He said, the only thing I've got, I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn from what I've been doing. Putting away the wickedness we talked about before. I'm going to put away what I've been doing. I have messed it up. And I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say, man, I don't know. I'll just be your servant. Just take me back. Help me out. He cried out to his father. But the key in this the statement of the father saw him from a long way off and ran to him. Speaking of God the Father. Again, what are we going to do? Are we going to do it ourselves? Or are we going to go to the father and ask him? Because the father saw him from a long ways off. Ran to him. He was looking. He was waiting. Knowing he was going to return. God's doing the same thing with each one of us now. We have, whether we are on top of the world and we are really in his will, or whether we're just taken out of his will, or whether we're completely falling away, or maybe we don't believe much at all, it's very weak. There he is. He's waiting. He's just standing there looking for us. He's waiting for us to cry out to him and say, Lord, help me. And he'll say, okay, I'm here for you. Come in. And he prepared a feast for that son. Because he came back. So what is this revival truly about? Yes, it's about bringing lost people to Christ. But it's also about us. Each one of us can use a revival in our own hearts. No matter where we are at in our Christian walk, we can all use a revival. We can all use that something from God to bring us to him stronger, to pull us to him. We can all use that. So think about that in the week coming up. Think about where you're at in your own heart. Think about 
what you want to be each and every day. How can I align my will with God's will? Not how can I get my will. Because if we are aligned with God's will, we will get what we want. Because we're already in his will. What we want is what he wants. So think about that. Like I said, through the next week, each and every day. And prepare our hearts to help those that are going to be out back for that revival. And I ask you to pray for each one of us that's speaking. To pray for the musicians that are going to be playing as well. And pray for hearts to be saved through this. And for hearts to be drawn closer to him that may have just fallen back a ways. And pray that through this revival, we can be that lighthouse we talked about that Bill sang about. We can truly be that light. And we wouldn't, as the one parable says, put a basketball That we would shine bright each and every one of us. So in our day-to-day -day walk, people would see us and say, yep, that's a believer. Yep, that's a Christian. And you can see it. The light just shines from us. Again, think about that in the week to come. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, what we can pull from it. We thank you for the fact that you sent your word, your son, to die for us, that we can be part of your family because of it. We ask that we would not live according to the flesh, but we would live according to the spirit. We ask that you would impress upon us daily that we just need to stay in your will. And if we do veer off course, and we try to do it on our own, you're just waiting there for us. Waiting for us to admit that we messed up and to cry out to you and say, Jesus, just help me. You're waiting for us. Open arms, ready to have a feast with us. We can see it so often through your word. We can see it all over the Old Testament where people have cried out to you and you have saved them. Saved them from themselves in some circumstances, saved them from others in other circumstances. But all we need to do is the few things that you've listed. To humble ourselves, to seek your face, to pray about it, to cry out through the prayer, and to turn from our wicked ways and to follow your ways, Lord. Just ask that any of the wicked ways that we have in our hearts, that you would expose them to us. That you would let us know today the problems we have in our heart. The issues we have. Expose them to us. Let us know where you want us to change. Where, if we cry out, you are willing to help us. To be that person you want us to be so we can live in your will. We thank you again for all that you do in each of our lives individually as well as a group here as the church, Lord. We just thank you for what you've done already. We thank you for the plans that you have in the future for us. We ask again that you would be upon this revival and just make it an amazing experience for everybody that's there. That you would bring some unsaved people in as well and just draw them to you so that they would know who you are and they would be involved like we are here today, Lord. Again, we thank you for all you do. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.